That song we sang, Lamb of Elohim, O Lamb of El, sweet Lamb of Elohim, I love the Holy Lamb, O wash me in your precious blood, by Yeshua, the Lamb of Elohim. This is the next verse, is the one I want to focus in on a little bit. I was so lost, I should have died. But you have brought me to your side, to the side of the creator of the universe, the word made flesh, to be led by your staff and rod, and to be called a lamb of Elohim, a lamb of God. How beautiful is that? <clears throat> Brethren, I, I can't say I speak for everyone, <clears throat> but I myself have been going through the Passover, keeping the observance, and the Holy Days, I guess 41 years. This is the, my 41st year. And um, I realize and understand what our Redeemer did as far as that payment that was made. We have what the Monopoly people who made the game of Monopoly call a get out of jail free card. Our offenses, our sins, whether out of ignorance or whether out of purpose, have been set far from him. So far, he compares it as the east is to the west. The two, the twain, never meet. What value is that? I asked that question my, I asked that question of myself, and I ask it of the brethren here. What value is that? <clears throat> what price would one put on that? Our Redeemer and our Father in Heaven put the price of His Son's life on that. His life. He's the creator of the universe. He is innocent of any wrongdoing. But he, our Redeemer, he took, the, he took the shame, the embarrassment, if you will, he took the guilt and all the suffering onto himself. Now, springtime is here. The daylight hours are now longer. We passed the spring equinox. Equinox merely means, it's, I think it's a Latin word for equal. And the nighttime hours are great. Daytime hours are longer than nighttime hours. The sun is warming the atmosphere, and life is beginning to be renewed. Two weeks ago, we could look out our dining room window, and there wasn't a leaf on the trees. And the grass, we, we live on 11 acres, and we have a lot to mow, but the grass was brown. Two weeks later, we need to get out there and mow the lawn. It must be six inches thick by now. And the trees are just pushing out leaves. But life is renewed. Is it any accident that Passover is in the spring? No. It's a reminder for us. He has life in him. He's life eternal, our creator, our redeemer. But he gives us these holy days in a, in a timing that is so apropos. It reminds us. And it's, it's a time of year. I don't know of anyone that doesn't like the spring, maybe except for maybe the allergies. And it's so beautiful. You step outside, and it's 70 degrees outside. You take off your long johns, you know, your extra shirts and your sweaters, and you're outside, and it's beautiful. Well, brethren, we are being renewed likewise. We are being renewed by and through his tender mercies. Our Father in heaven gave us his son, us, and I say us, instead of us, to pay for that price. I don't know how deeply that sinks in, but in a world of mass confusion, it's like, it's like a tremendous peace. Remember Paul talk about, talks about the helmet, um, the guard your head, the sword of the truth, the shield of, the shield, and, uh, I forget all the, uh, all the uh, shield of faith. But the helmet, salvation. And what does the helmet 
remind you of in scriptures. Paul talks about in everything that we do, everything, and I mean everything, to give thanks to our Father in heaven in the Messiah's name. And what's the next verses that follow? Anybody remember? And our Father in heaven will grant us his peace. That transcends all understanding. Will grant us his peace to guard our hearts and minds. Now that word guard used is a garrison. It protects the head, the heart, and the mind. You hear through the ears. You think through your mind. And I believe that's what part of the helmet of salvation is. We have his peace. We are at peace with him. That cannot be bought. It cannot be legislated. It cannot be bartered or traded. It comes from one place, from him only. There again, what would you, what price would you put on that? And to interject here, the title of my talk is called Remember the I Am. Luke 11.22 and 1 Corinthians 11.24 and 25. We are told to take the bread and the wine in remembrance of our Redeemer. And Paul goes on to say, proclaiming his death until he comes. What is significant? What is proclaiming his death? What is in it? What does it do? Okay. Taking the bread and the wine speaks louder than words. It is not an acclamation. I'm sorry. It is. Uh, it is an. I'm sorry. It is an acclamation without words. That those who practice this have been set free and are waiting by faith for his return, at which time we will join him. Like it says in the song, he brought us along his side. An eternal life and be like him. And that's what the foot washing and the Passover is about. Is about. Some may observe it and not understand there was only 12 that did it the first time, and they didn't really understand. Our Redeemer says, you don't fully understand. Do you know what I've done? There must have been question marks on all 12 faces. But he knew down the road, when, that spirit, when, his, when he sends that spirit, that comforter, all these question marks would turn into bright light bulbs. Oh, I understand. I see. Remember what he said to Thomas? Thomas, you believe because you can stick your fingers in my hands and you can see me. You knew I was dead and you can see me. But 2,300 years later, there's going to be those who will believe and never see me. Not in their lifetime. They're the ones that are blessed, Thomas. Blessed are those. That's us, brethren. That's us. What would have happened if he did not give himself? What would have happened? Well, we wouldn't be here, I suppose. Paul, I think Paul wraps it up very nicely. He says, we, as Paul said, would be most miserable. If he didn't follow through, and he didn't have to, he told Peter, put the sword away. Don't you know I can, I can petition my father and he will send five legions of angels, 60,000 angels, 60,000. One angel went through the camp of Sennacherib in one night and took out 183,000 troops. They, these were soldiers armed to the teeth. One angel of death took them out. What do you think 60,000 would do? But our Creator and our Redeemer, our Father in Heaven and our Redeemer, knew this. And our Redeemer knew He had that potential at any time. Getting slapped across the face, getting spit upon, okay? Being called a drunkard, 
by his own people. His own people. He had to say, you have a demon in you. Who do you think you are? You were born of fornication. You were born of adultery. You're just the B-A-S-T-A-R-D. That's what it would be. And he said, you dishonor me. You say you know my father. You don't know my father. I know him, but you don't know him. But brethren, we know him. We know him. If we don't know him, then we are wasting our time here. Are there other things we should remember about the I am while we wait for him? Let's take a look at some of what has been recorded about our Redeemer. Now, I want to let's go to John chapter 4. Some may already know where this is going. But you know, brethren, we learn by repetition. I remember in grade school. Remember the flashcards in grade school? They'd hold them up. Practice, practice, practice. In the military, if you want to get good at what you do, or if you're a SWAT team member, or if you're a, an Army Ranger, or a Navy SEAL, what do they put you through? Practice. What do the astronauts go through? Practice, practice. You'll learn that. You'll learn. It's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. The more you use the scriptures, the longer it stays in here, the more you know how to use it. You become fine-tuned. Fine-tuned. Let's pick it up in verse 20. Now, this is the Messiah talking to the woman at the well. Now let's back up. Let's go to verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw water. Didn't understand. Now, here's the Redeemer, 3D, in person, living color, and didn't understand who he was. But we do. What's the difference? The woman saith unto him, uh, I'm sorry, Yahshua said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. I wonder if he was going to talk to the husband because he wasn't getting too far with the wife. But there was a problem here too. The woman answered and said, I have no husband, Messiah said unto her, Thou hast well said, You have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now ha you have now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. They say that today about our Redeemer. Ah, oh, he, he was a great prophet. He was a... Uh, he was a good man, a kind man. They won't attribute. They won't attribute the power and the title of Elohim or God unto him, the Son of the Living God. They won't do that. Or there are those that won't do that. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that it is in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Yahshua said unto them, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye not what ye understand or know. For salvation is of the Jews. Well, he was rejected by them. They couldn't stand him. Not all of them. But the theocrats hated him. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Elohim is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. What else is spiritual, brethren, that you know of in scriptures? What is tantamount, a big, a, a big mark on our calling cards? What else is spiritual? 
the commandments of our Creator. Paul said the commandments are spiritual. The woman saith unto him, I know that uh, Messiah cometh, which is called the, uh, the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. The Messiah said unto her, I that speaketh unto thee am he. I am. She didn't recognize him. She didn't recognize him. But you know what else? He's a nonconformist. The Jews would have nothing to do with the Samaritan. This was a Samaritan woman. And she even said earlier on, well, you know, what do you do with us? And when his disciples come, they're wondering why he's communicating with the Samaritan. He's a nonconformist. And this ties in with another verse down the road, another chapter and verse. Let's turn to John 11. We must, and it is necessary that we remember his sacrifice. But that's not where it stops. There's so much more to remember of what that sacrifice means. He told his apostles. You, you, hear, you, you, listen, you hear me saying, I go to the Father and I go away. And you have become sad in heart. But he said to me, he says to them, be of good cheer. I'm paraphrasing, brethren. I know you know where these are. Be of good cheer. I have overcome, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. The holy days of, of uh, Passover and the foot washing is serious. It is solemn. But there's a lot of joy in it. He said to the apostles, if you understood I was going to the Father, you would be joyful. But we don't understand. They didn't understand. John 11. Okay, let's pick it up in verse 17. John 11, verse 17. Then when the Messiah, Yeshua, came, he found that he had laid in the, in the grave for four days already. This is Lazarus. The, 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 we, we pick it up with Lazarus' death. Now Bethany was um, nigh unto Jerusalem. It was close, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Messiah was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto the Messiah, Master, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She didn't understand either. My point is, brethren, we've been given the understanding. <laughs> We've been given, it's been given to us, like he told Thomas, blessed are those who will believe. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of Elohim, Elohim will give it to thee. Now she understood that he came from our Father in heaven, but I don't think she realized just who he was. Messiah said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. And her answer is, is, indicates that she still didn't catch on. Martha said unto him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She was thinking if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. I know he's going to rise up on the last day. The Messiah said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou that? He asked her, do you believe this? She said unto him, yes, master, I do. I believe that thou art the Messiah, the son of the Elohim, which should come into the world. 
but I don't think she realized who, fully, who he was. And when he said, and when, I'm sorry, my eyes aren't what they used to be. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now, Messiah was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were in, with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she was rose up, hastily went and followed her. Okay, she goeth into the grave to weep there. They thus what they were thinking. Then when Mary was come where the Messiah was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Master, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. That's a, a basically a repeat of her sister, what her sister said. Messiah therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Why? Why do you think he groaned in his spirit and was troubled? They didn't understand. They didn't understand. That's what I, I believe they just didn't understand. And said, where have you laid him? That's what he said. Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Master, come and see. Messiah wept. He wept for Jerusalem. He wept for those who, you know, didn't know who he was or didn't care to know. Or you're upsetting my lifestyle with what you're telling me. Uh, then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And, and, um, and some said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? You're going through with the same thing again. They still don't understand. Yahshua therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Yahshua said, Take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, and saith unto him, Master. But this time he's going to have an odor. He stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. That was on purpose. The Messiah said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of Elohim. That passage, brethren, is down there for us. If we would believe, thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of Elohim. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead were, where the dead was laid. And Yahshua lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always. And because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he, that, when he, he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And we know the rest of it. Uh, it seems like, and, and, and the scripture tells us this also, that the carnal mind is enmity to our creator. It's against enmity. It's just against. It's like, a, it's like pre-stress hardened concrete. It's awfully hard to get through to it. Get through it. But not so. Not so with us, brethren. We're those ones that our creator talked about with Thomas. And I hope and pray that we're not this way. And I realize that the flesh is weak, the spirit is strong. But he's still given us his Holy Spirit, and he is still very much patient with us, all of us. So, the Samaritan woman, he was nonconformist. He didn't judge the woman. He just said, well, the husband you have is not your husband. He was kind to her, and he told her that worshiping our Father in heaven will no longer be in buildings. 
It's going to be of, in temples not made by hands. And we are not made by human hands. None of us here can make a person. We can bring the, the, uh, the proper items together to have a baby born or, come to, or, or, or develop. But we can't make the human body. And we are his temple. Let's go to John chapter 8. We'll speak in verse 1. Yahshua went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, this is John chapter 8, verse 1, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And here we go with the scribes and the Pharisees. They brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, they're very politically correct. They refer to him with the right uh, uh, position, of, if you will, master, teacher. This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? <laughs> what do you say? They said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him, have something to accuse him. But Messiah stooped down and with his finger wrote in the sand as though he heard them not. Now, that phrase, as though he heard them not, is not in the original text. That's been added in. Okay. So when they continued asking him, apparently they pressed him. Well, what do you think? Are you going to answer us? This woman is, is an adulteress. He lifted up himself and said unto them, now it depends on which translation you're using. This one says, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast the stone at her. I have another translation. I, I forgot to bring it with me. My, my wife says, don't forget the Bibles. And I said, I got them. Well, I forgot that one. The other one says, he who has not been with her cast the first stone. Interesting. Now, what does the law say? What does Moses say about the one caught in adultery? How do you commit adultery by yourself? There's always two. Takes two to tango, folks. Where's the man? Where's the guy? They don't bring him. They just brought the woman. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. They which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and the Jews and the Jews left alone. I'm sorry, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Can you imagine how she felt? She wasn't sure if she was going to get stoned to death or what was going to happen. All these guys standing around. In fact, she may even have been in the sack with some of these guys that are accusing her. And in verse 10, Messiah had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those that accuse you? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, master. And he said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's our advocate, brethren. That's the advocate we have on high. That's the one that took our sins of adultery, if they apply, fornication, hatred, which is tantamount to murder, stealing, cursing, disobeying parents, slopping up the temple, making a mess of things, and he took it all away. He took it all away. That's our advocate. That's our master. That's our shepherd. They are the things we need to remember about the foot washing and Passover. Not just that he died. He, that's very important. Well, we have a tremendous amount to be thankful for. Like he told the apostles, if you understood, you guys would be rejoicing. 
but you don't. But I will send the Spirit unto you, and he will bring things into remembrance for you when that time comes. And 8, verse 8, 58. This is, this is the Jews questioning him. Your father Abraham started in um, verse 56. Well, I'll tell you what, brethren. Yeah, let's pick it up. Let's pick it up in 55. Our Redeemer's talking to the Jews, and they're referring to him as, well, our father is Abraham. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say that I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his sayings. He's referring to his father. And that was uh, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your Elohim. If I honor my father... My father, if I'm sorry, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. But it is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your Elohim. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and I keep his sayings. He keeps the commandments of his father, and his father honors him. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto himself, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Messiah said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> that sent them into a frenzy of rock picking, getting ready to throw them. Do we realize that? Do we realize? Do we realize that? Something to be very thankful for, brethren, and to remember about the I am. And John chapter 10. It's like we're going through the entire book of John here almost. But it's interesting. John has there's a lot of meat in John. And let's see. He's talking about the good shepherd. Let's pick it up in verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. I know my sheep, and they know me. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. These are things to remember, and he did lay that down. We remembered that um, two nights ago, two days ago. Verse 16, and this is what we don't know. And it's not for us to judge. Verse 16, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. He has other sheep. I remember in the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that there is no other church. There is no other fold outside of the worldwide church of God. That was it. Any, anyone else keeping the Sabbath was marginalized. But that's not for us to decide that. I have other sheep. What should be the reaction to that? Should be a lot of joy. Should be very happy. There's others. We're not the only ones out here. There's others. That's up to our Redeemer. He's the one that paid the price. And he goes on to say in verse 17, Therefore doth my father love me because I laid down my life 
that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. And where did he get the power from? The verse, the continuation of verse 18. This commandment have I received from my father. He received it from his father. So he has sheep. He has an ecclesia. He has a group of people, whatever you want to call it. But he has them. And there he is. They know him. He knows them. He knows us. <coughs> Excuse me. John 14. Uh, let's see. Let's turn over to John 14, please. And we'll pick up in verse 27. Let's pick it up in 23. Messiah answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, we all know that verse in that chapter, chapter and verse. But do we understand what that means? He that loveth me not, he, he, he that uh, loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which is sent, who has sent me. These things I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have to say unto you. Here we go with the peace. Peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let, them, let, let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye would have rejoiced, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and have nothing with me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let's go from hence. And Peter was ready to die with him, but he wasn't. He wasn't. He didn't have he didn't have the spirit. He didn't have the strength. The mortal heart and mind, the carnal mind is weak. It caves. That spirit of our creator, we need that. We need that indwelling. My peace I give you, my peace I live you, I leave with you. How important is that? How very important is that, brethren? John 16, 32 and 33. All right. Messiah, uh, let's, let's pick it up in 30. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and indeed not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou comest from Elohim. Yahshua has answered, said, do you now believe? <laughs> do you now believe? And verse 32, I'm not picking on these guys. Don't get me wrong. Um, don't get me wrong. I don't know if I could do any better at all. But what I'm saying is, this is all written for us. It's written here for us. His prayer was for the, his apostles, his disciples, and for those who would learn and be taught by their word. Yahshua said, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, 
that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father was with me. Well, suppose that happens to us. You know, what is, what is a military tactic? Divide and conquer. Break them up in smaller groups, and you can take them out. Because in numbers, there is strength. But they don't know our creator. They don't know our redeemer. These things I have spoken to you. I'm sorry. Behold the hour. Okay, and these things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world. Ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have conquered the world. I have conquered the world. And then... Um, A, a very important one, brethren. We have to go back to chapter, chapter 10, verse 29. And this is tantamount importance. <coughs> chapter 10. Oh, I'm, no wonder I'm not. I'm in chapter 11. Sorry about that. This is about the sheep and hearing his voice. I'm going to pick it up in 26. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. He's talking to these unbelievers, these people that don't, probably the scribes and the Pharisees. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Do we believe that wholeheartedly? That we're in the hands of our Father in Heaven, no matter what happens. That's a, that's a challenge. That that uh, verse twenty nine is my Father, which gave them to me, is greater, and no man. It's almost like looking someone in the eye and saying, "Give me your best shot. See if you can get them out of my hand." You can't. They cannot be plucked away. The only way, brethren, we can that can happen, is if. We walk away. And the biggest and the worst weapon the adversary has is fear. Fear will just make you into a wet noodle. But perfect love, Scripture says, perfect love in who? In our Creator. Cast out all fear. That's why our Redeemer wasn't afraid of any one of them. He pulled no punches. He was not politically correct. He told them the truth. All right. Um, let's head back to verse 8. There's a short verse here. In verse, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 8. This is also very, very true. Of course, Scripture is true. When I say true, uh, it's something to remember about our Redeemer and our Creator. Very important. Now, pick it up in verse 31. Chapter 8, verse 31. Then said the Messiah to those Jews which believed on Him. Now they believed on Him. He said, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they got offended. That's another thing he knew how to do. But he, he didn't do it purposely. It's the natural progression of the truth. The truth does not know offense, or it doesn't know non-offense. The truth is the truth, is the truth. They answered him, 
We are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? <laughs> the truth will set you free. What is the truth? And what is freedom? What freedom is he talking about? That freedom that we are free from, brethren, is the nonsense that is baggage that was hung around our neck and our backs. We carried for years. Okay, he took it away, and all of that stuff led led us right down to the to the uh, path of destruction. He took all of it away. He gave us the truth. My burden is light. My yoke is sweet. He told the scribes and the Pharisees, the theocrats, by your traditions you make my father's word of no avail. You, you generate these, these doctrines, these traditions, you lay them on the shoulders of the people, and you won't lift one finger to do them. Meaning, it sounds like our political system. They're going to tax the living daylights out of you, but they're not going to pay it themselves. I'm not picking on them, but it, it's, it's human nature. It's the way... It's the way we are. But we've been called out of it. We've been called out of it, and we've been given his wonderful grace. How important is that? Let's go to Revelations. I'm going to close in Revelations. Revelations, we probably know this. Revelations is, well, I guess, is not so popular as far as being talked at, about from the pulpit. But let's see what we can do. Pick it up in verse 3. I'm sorry, chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them, and be their Elohim, their mighty one, their El Shaddai. And Elohim shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And this is what we are looking forward to, brethren. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh, important brethren, verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. <laughs> 